Hello and welcome back. We are uh, going to carry on talking about TCPIP. This is Hugh Waters over here in Gloucestershire talking to young Phil over there in London City. There you go. And uh, we are carrying on with something that uh, Richard Lancaster asked us to talk about, um, which was TCPIP and internet protocols and the good stuff that goes with it. Uh, so uh, this time we're actually going to focus now on types of protocols and some go into more depth than we did last time or rather Phil is because he's the one that knows Phil. Well I'm in the fortunate position and we mentioned this earlier that, that uh, this is actually very much based off a, uh, a sort of a training taster that I've done a few times for, for Route 6 the people I work for and I've got the uh, the web address uh, the, the, the website of that up on screen at the moment if you want to go look at that um, so you know ready for uh, to come and, and teach in your machine room uh, weddings bar mitzvahs etc so um uh, well, what what are, what kind of bar mitzvahs have you been to? With <laughs> yeah, we, aren't you meant to put that at the end of uh, you, you know, available for all things? You know, <laughs> weddings, bar mitzvahs, and funerals, maybe. <laughs> um, so yeah, we talked about we talked about um, uh, um, why packet switch networks. Um, you know, uh, we presented a sort of a, a simplified model of a packet switch network. You, you know, sort of showing what the internet really sort of looks like. Um, layers, why they're important, and we, we talked about the difference between the OSI seven layer model, which I don't think is too useful. Um, it's taught a lot in academia, but I think actually the Cisco or the the, the ARPANET um, model uh, is is much more effective at sort of conveying to people, uh, you know, how 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 the stack within a, a computer's networking system works. We talked about IP addresses, the difference between IP addresses, subnet masks, and MAC addresses, and how you have IP addresses that are routable i.e. they work out on the internet and how you have IP addresses that are, are limited to just use on local area networks and, and, they, and they couldn't work on the internet because they're, they're reserved local area network addresses so the 192.168 type networks that you probably find at home or at work they don't work on the internet they have to have a router between them and the rest of the world wide web the rest of the internet and we also mentioned about ports and how as well as packets going from one machine to another carry this source and destination IP address to get them where they need to go. They also have a port number as well to say, which which pretty much defines what kind of traffic that packet is. It's a web part of a web page, part of an FTP transfer of files or whatever. And and, and so that brings us quite neatly now to talking about the difference between UDP IP and TCP IP. <coughs> Uh, and, and, and I suppose um, UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. And the fundamental difference is that, that, that UDP is a very lightweight uh, protocol that, that basically allows packets to get where they're going, but if they don't, they don't, and you just got to kind of monitor it and try again. TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, TCP IP, if it's going over Internet Protocol, um, uh, is, is very much more about keeping a track of all the packets making sure uh, they're sequenced so we know how to reassemble them at the other end um, and, and requesting retransmission if packets have been lost, uh, you know, if they haven't been delivered in a timely manner, uh, you know, uh, making sure that, that the piece of software that's using the TCP connection doesn't have to worry about all that stuff. So the FTP program you're using to drag files from one machine to another, like maybe across a, to, to a distant server, um, it doesn't have to worry about things getting lost, about about packets being nulled up in transmission, about about things arriving out of sequence, because the protocol TCP/IP takes care of all that. Whereas UDP, user datagram protocol, doesn't. It, it, it's much more lightweight. It doesn't have all that heavy lifting. So, so you, UDP doesn't actually sequence the, the data. Um. Uh, it does, but just for its just for other reasons, for its own entertainment. For so, so there's a whole load of things that go into the in, into the into the header of a packet. Uh, uh, and sequence numbers are always there, but UDP doesn't really isn't really obliged to use them. And also, um, it, so, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll come on to what the, a packet header looks like and what those various things um, uh, okay. you know do. Um, TCP is also interesting because TCP has this concept of a, a connection, whereas UDP is connectionless. Uh, TCP has this idea of of, of a handshaking uh, uh, part of of the operation to to, to to start a connection, so so a, a client and a server are talking to each other, uh, data is moved with all the kind of uh, protection that TCP brings of making sure that things work properly and that the software doesn't have to worry about things arriving out of sequence or packets being lost, etc. And then at the end of the TCP operation, the connection, this virtual connection, is then gracefully closed. So 
Um, so we kind of summarise that in those three bullet points. Uh, a connection yeah. is established with a multi-step handshake. Uh, there's a data transfer phase. And then after the data transmission is complete, uh, the connection uh, uh, is closed, again, using a, a well-defined uh, set of, of, of handshaking processes. Um, and, and if you're writing software that relies on TCP, you don't have to be aware of the underlying plumbing of the internet. You don't have to be aware of, of all this kind of you know, only just workingness of the network. Um, uh, and, and as mentioned, uh, UDPIP, it dispenses with all that heavy lifting that TCP provides. Uh, and, uh, right. you know, it's a lot more lean and mean. It's more appropriate for streamed media. You know, if you're listening to the iPlayer, you know, radio iPlayer or whatever, that's arriving over UDP for sure. Uh, DNS, the domain name lookup system, that's all done over UDP. And things like DHCP uh, uh, and, uh, and RIP, those those protocols that allow you to acquire network addresses um, when a machine starts up, they're all done over UDP as well. Um, yeah. And so UDP is, I suppose, a bit more of a utility protocol, kind of the undergirding of, of the internet. So so here we go. Here's here's the structure of a TCP IP packet. It's a, a, ah, right. a picture stolen from Wikipedia, page 11 on the notes, if you're following. Um, yeah. And... Uh, uh, so, so there we go. There's, there's the, um, uh, you know, we're starting with with a, a, a you know, bit zero. Um, uh, you know, there's two bytes for the source port, two bytes for the destination port. You know, if we, 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 we said that uh, we could have up to sixty five thousand port numbers, but but up to a thousand and twenty four, they're reserved for for well defined things like email and, and web and stuff. And above one thousand twenty four, uh, you know, it's the kind of wild west. You can use them for whatever you like. So a packet carries both a source port and a destination port, um, uh-huh. uh, which is important when you start thinking about how packets move through routers. Uh, a sequence number, which is um, a 32-bit number, which uh, is normally uh, starts, it's, pseudo, it's, it's randomly seeded. So when you start a, a, a series of packets uh, for a transfer, um, they, they go in sequential number, but they start at some pseudo-random number. And, and it allows routers at each end to keep track of packets. Uh, acknowledgement numbers. Um, uh, which is um, you know again similar to the sequence number, but but what comes back from the router? Uh, uh, then uh, there's a whole bunch of reserved things. Uh, window sizes. You might you might have come across um, uh, um, people who claim to be able to improve your networking speed by changing MTUs, maximum transmission unit sizes. They're oh, all yeah. defined in the packet headers. Uh, checksums and uh, and then kind of optional stuff you know that can be put into the header. So occasionally. Google will come up with some clever extensions. Uh, Google are currently uh, pushing a protocol called Speedy, S-P-D-D-Y, which is a sort of streamed web protocol that allows you to assemble all the elements of a web page into a single stream and transfer those in one go. And, it, and, and you know, from a from a sort of a, a browsing point of view, it makes websites feel two or three times quicker. Um, and that's all done by by using the optional space within packet headers, where Google uh, can say this is a, this is a special Google Speedy header. Um, but, but to, to start off a TCP handshake, a, t- a TCP connection, to open up that virtualized connection so that um, a computer could start you know, usefully using a TCP um, link, um, you have to have this thing called the three-way TCP handshake. So, uh, uh, and, 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 and so, so if, we, if we start thinking about um, uh, you know, uh, a client computer, which might be running maybe a web browser, and the server yeah. computer somewhere else in the world that's running the web server software, and uh, the client computer wants to be able to start downloading the elements that make up a web page. Uh, and so the very first thing it has to do is, is, is there's a, typically the, the, the client will send a SYN packet, a synchronizing packet, uh, and, it, uh, and it sets a, uh, the, the segment sequence number within the packet header to some random value and sends it off in the direction of the server that it wants to talk to. So in response, that server replies with a SYNAC packet uh, uh, and uh, with the acknowledgement number set to one greater than the sequence number, uh, and uh, and the sequence number that's returned in the SYNAC packet is again a randomly assigned number. Uh, and then finally, the, the client sends uh, uh, an ACK back to the server, with the sequence number set to the received acknowledgement value, and the acknowledgement number set to one more than the received sequence number. So so essentially, the two computers have said, uh, hello, and the, the, the server machine responded, hello to you. And then the, the client said, yes, I, I, I acknowledge your hello. So there's a little three-way handshake taking place. At this point, no real data has moved across the network at all. But this kind of allows stuff to start happening. It allows the server to say, I've got a computer 
that's going to want to start dealing with me, I better start reserving some memory space for this connection. I better start reserving some resources so I can service this this connection. Yeah. And uh, the other interesting thing about this is is that it means you can't spoof an IP address if you're using TCP because you as a computer, your IP address, you say you send your SIN packet. If you were sending a fake IP address in your in your SIN packet packets header. When the server responded, the packet would never make it back to you. And so the TCP three-way handshake is a very effective way of you knowing that the IP addresses of the machines at each end are who they say they were. You can't spoof yeah. those IP addresses because the packets will go elsewhere if you do. So that's quite yeah. a, a useful way of, of, of sort of starting a little secure session there. Yeah. And we've got, we got, a, we got a, a diagram here that shows that initiation phase, the SYN packet, yeah. the SYN and the ACK. And, and, and so once once the app packet's been received, uh, you know, we, we, we've said to have started a TCP session. So we could then start thinking about, so, so that, that, that's like a very tiny fragment of, of some communication. Actually, there's a whole load of things go on. Hundreds and hundreds of connections have to be opened and closed for anything meaningful to happen. Um, and one of the things that confuses people is, well, I know that my network card in my computer or my laptop or the wireless adapter in my iPod or whatever has to have an IP address. It's, it's been a long time since we routinely assumed we'd be typing those IP addresses in and phoning up the yeah. guy downstairs in IT and saying, oh, what, what, what IP address do I need for my laptop, um, Bob? Uh, uh, but, but nowadays, we've got this thing called DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol, where yeah. a router or a DHCP server on a big network will dish out IP addresses as they're asked for. So if we imagine a, a computer powering up, the operating system loads, so Microsoft Windows or Mac OS X or, or Linux or whatever loads up, and, and the network card driver and the, and the IP stack that will service this communication uh, uh, loads up. So now the network has to acquire some settings from the DHCP server. So the operating system issues a DHCP request over UDP. So there's no three-way handshake for this. It's just a UDP request. But remember, at this point, the PC has no IP address. It's got no means of being a well-behaved person on this network. So all it can do is send it out uh, to the broadcast address. And if you remember, we said 255 is reserved. It's a special number yeah. in IP networking. So it sends out, uh, 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 it squawks out, um, uh, using uh, the broadcast address rather than any IP address it might have, 255.255.255.255. Uh, and so any router on the network or a DHCP server that's able to respond, uh, it will it will respond with the offer of an IP address. Uh, so that's just basically saying, help, I need an IP address. Yeah, who am I? You know, who am me I? Up. How, how can I behave I'm nicely on this up. network? I've no idea who yeah, I am. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Amnesia. Um, so the router responds with a DHCP offer. And again, that's back on the broadcast address because the PC hasn't yet got anything. Uh, uh, so the operating system of the computer concerned uh, acknowledges that over UDP IP with the IP address uh, that was offered to it um, because there might be multiple DHCP servers. And so you you don't want to be responding to the DHCP server that, that was second kind of thing. They might, they might all respond and say, ah, yes, I'm DHCP server number five, and I offer you an IP address. Uh, but, of course, DHCP server seven and two might also have responded. So so your DHCP request response has to include the IP address that was offered to you so that the appropriate server knows uh, that, that, that you and it are starting a, a bit of a relationship. Uh, so, so once that's happened, uh, the router or the DHCP server that made that offer and it sees your DHCP request come back with the IP address it offered you, it will then offer up some other details, uh, DNS numbers, lease time, i.e. how long this IP address is good for, uh, and, and the IP address of the router so that so that you can get out to the internet. Uh, and that's, that's, that's called the DHCP acknowledge. So with that sort of transaction there, all over UDP, all without the benefit of TCP, now your computer is able to behave as a, as a well-behaved uh, citizen on your network. It's got all it needs to not only talk on the local area network, but what it needs to talk on the internet. So, so that's a little involved dance that's gone on, and all that's allowed us to do is to actually assign an IP address and, and some DNS numbers and such to a card. Um, yeah. But now, so that's all happened and we're happy, that the person sits down at, the, uh, at, the, at their computer and they fire up their web browser and they want to go to www.route6.com. Uh, and, and who would want a fine address? A fine, a fine website. That's just, uh, it's just a, 
<laughs> pop that back up on screen. There we go. Look at that. All our training offerings. Um, but uh, uh, so we now have to think about the four layer model that we talked about previously. And uh, I'll, I'll make reference to Firefox. That's my favourite web browser. But you know, there's there's Internet Explorer, there's Safari, there's uh, there's uh, there's um, uh, what's what's the other one that lots of people like? Um, I I use I use Chrome all the time. I like Chrome. Uh, there's another one which has been around for ages, isn't there? Which I can't remember what it's called. Um, Opera. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, if you use Opera, I know lots of engineers do. Um, so I so, have it on my machine. I occasionally look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so with respect to our four layer model. Um, we've got an, a, a web browser which we'll call Firefox is running, and that's running at the application layer, and that has to request a web page. So you type it in www.root6.com, hit the return key, and the web browser has to do something with that. So the transport layer of the operating system's IP stack checks to see if it has a recent record of having visited that site, uh, and if if it hasn't, if it doesn't, if it's never, it hasn't seen Root6 recently. Um, it will issue a DNS request, a domain name system lookup request, to the internet layer of the operating system. So the, the, the network layer, the internet layer, um, sends the request out um, uh, over, uh, as a, again, as a UDP request, port 53, that's how DNS works, um, saying, look, I've got this domain name, I don't know what on earth to do with it, um, could you please you know, hook me up with some IP details for this domain name? So the router at the gateway of, of your network uh, it, it may, depending on how it's configured, it may just proxy that request out onto the internet, or it might say, um, it, it might be a better router, it might be a, one with some memory and some, some tables in it and stuff. It might say, haha, uh, Dave upstairs in accounts, he went to uh, Route 6 recently, and here's the IP address. We know the IP address is still good because because the, the time to live on that IP address hasn't expired yet, and it will it will serve back a response to that, to that DNS request. Uh, back to the computer that asked for it, but if 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 the router either doesn't have that capability or um, nobody in, in in the company since the router was powered up has, has been to www.route6.com, it will send it out uh, upstream to the ISP's DNS server, and the ISP's DNS server may well be able to fulfil that request, or it may not. It might have to say, oh, nobody you know on our little network, you know, of all the people we serve has been to route6.com. We don't know what on earth that is. We better pass it up to. Uh, the B level, um, which is typically um, the network backbone provider, and that will be a big rack of DNS servers at the London Internet Exchange. And hey, maybe you've only just registered this domain name, and and, and nobody in the world has gone to it yet, or nobody in, in London or, or in England's gone to it yet. Yeah. And so those DNS servers have to say, flipping out, we've never seen this before. We better consult the root A servers, uh, which are distributed around the world, and they're the final authority of the DNS system and so they might pass that request up to there and eventually this request will trickle all the way back to your machine and say okay www.root6.com that instantiates to an IP address of 193.203.84.196 and that's the server that's running the web server software that's got the Root6 website on it so you, you know this will eventually get back to your machine well I say eventually milliseconds later um, but then, of course, all the things along the path have got a little record of the Route 6 IP address now that they know. They, their DNS tables have been updated, and, and they know that if anybody else asks for it, the DNS lookup will be correspondingly quicker. And, in fact, the, the network stack on your computer will keep a record of that as well. Um, so, so now we're, so the computer's sorted out with an IP address. It's sorted out with... Uh, it's requested a web page, and uh, it's got an IP address for the web server it's after. Um, so not much has happened yet, uh, but, but kind of an awful lot has happened as well. Um, so the transport layer of the operating system's IP stack issues a request uh, for the web page, the internet layer, using this newly acquired IP address. And that forms the start of the TCP session. And it's, up until this point, it's all been done over UDP. Uh, and it's only uh, now that TCP starts to get its hands dirty, starts to rub its hands together and, and roll up its sleeves and start doing the, the heavy lifting that it's good at. And the network layer... Um, uh, you know, sort of like only one layer up from from the uh, from the from the physical layer, uh, that sends the request out over the appropriate interface, whether it's an Ethernet cable or a, a Wi-Fi connection, um, to the router. And of course, because we know it's it's a web page that it's requesting, that has a local port number of eighty, uh, and the router gets that request, and the, the router probably um, uh, just quickly turns that around. If it's not a proxying router, it turns that around and sends it out on its internet-facing interface, which might be an ADSL connection or a cable modem. And then it sends it in the direction of the IP address that's now embedded in the header of that those packets, uh, you know, the, the IP address we just read out. Uh, and it also takes a note of which computer on the network made that request. 
because it, it saw the sequence number of the packet go through and it, it takes uh-huh. a little note. Haha. Hughes PC made that request. I'll remember that sequence number you know, for when it comes back. The other thing that, 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 that the router has to do is that it has to strip off the local area network address that that packet has and put on the internet facing IP address of the router. Uh, this process is called network address translation uh, and send it on its way. So, you know, many, many computers hide behind a router and the router has to have some way of knowing which PC deserves this bit of stuff as it comes back. Uh, and it's all, that's yeah. all done by keeping a record of sequence numbers and, and because, you know, you can have 100 computers all going to root6.com and they all want to get the right parts of the website that they requested. They all, they all want to see the appropriate pages they requested and not the one that the guy next door requested. So that's all done with the sequence numbers of the packet headers. So... Uh, so the IP stack of the PC returns the packet up the network, the internet layer, the transport layer, and finally the application layer, and and and, and now we can kind of start browsing the page. You, you know, it's kind of all that stuff's gone on, uh, you know, and and we haven't even started to build the web page yet. Uh, and e- even that's a very simplified example because we've we've ignored the heavy lifting protocols of the internet, which is the border gateway protocol, which keeps track of where things are on the web on the internet, and and how best to get to them and such. Uh, uh, we've we've only really just sort of skirted around the idea that, that TCP packets get lost, uh, things have to be retried, things arrive out of sequence, and that's all handled by the the um, the transport layer of the network stack. Uh, we haven't really touched on uh, on address resolution protocol, which is the the table that your router builds that allows you to translate IP addresses into MAC addresses and back again. Because the the router, at least on its Ethernet port side, is dealing with MAC addresses. Obviously, on its ADSL side, it's dealing probably with IP addresses. Uh, and then imagine the horror if if this PC is on a wireless network. There's a whole slew of protocols that have to sit on top of it, yeah. all this, you know, to manage the the encryption for wireless and and the negotiation for channels and all that kind of stuff on a wireless network. So I have to say, as you're talking, I'm just thinking tomorrow I'm going to be coming up to London. And I'm going to catch a train, but to do that I have to get a lift to the station uh, because I shan't be driving back because um, I'm going to go and drink beer in London with friends. Um, uh, the trains, of course, don't run synchronously with each other, so there'll be lots of trains and lots of hanging about. How the heck did this lot get together when you re- think just how much interconnectivity is required and how many groups of people coming up with uh, with things to make it all come together? It's just bewildering. But yet you can encapsulate in your mind the idea of catching the train or getting to the station or going for a drink in London. And, and those sort of three-word expressions encapsulate a whole load of stuff don't they it's all I suppose life experience for you and in the case of the internet it's 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 just thousands of things going on all tedious little exchanges of packets that yeah. kind of you know that's amazing mm. so so if you then think all that allowed us to do was to get an IP address get the IP address of the server we wanted to talk to and open up a connection to a web server and then we have to we're opening and closing sessions to, to get to get JPEGs and GIFs and, and the text that makes up the HTML and maybe other elements that make up the web page, and this happens you know in half a second from when you hit the enter key to the root six page being presented to you on your screen, and yet thousands literally thousands and thousands of transactions have gone on to allow that to happen, and it's it's just staggering that it works at all. You know, I'm, every time yeah. I use a browser, I, I'm kind of amazed. So. Putting all that kind of sort of mind-bending stuff behind us, um, you, we, we talked about about subnet masks, and and yeah. and we also should really talk about classes of IP addresses. So um, yes, because you've been talking about class A and class B, or is that is that what you mean? Yes. Well, so so network address translation, which is the thing we've kind of hinted at, that breaks the yeah. fundamental rules of the internet that every host should be reachable by every other host, and uh, you know, everybody should have a routable IP address. But in these days of, of uh, you know address space depletion, it's impossible. We have to have uh, network address translation routers. And you could argue that it's it's actually desirable because you know most of the traffic on my network is probably between you know my PC and the printer hanging off the server next door and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so it's appropriate that most of that is kept within my local area network. Um, but the original intention of the internet was that. Actually, every machine on the web, every machine on the network would have a routable IP address, <coughs> and and you know that's how things would work. Any machine could get to any other machine, you know, you know, and there wouldn't be this idea of of, of firewalls and and 
uh, network address translation routers and such. And so there's this idea of a uh, uh, of different classes of network, um, class A, class B, class C, and, and it, it just basically says how many addresses hide behind a, a given set of IP addresses. Um, so you probably never have to deal with classes of networks if you're setting up local area networks. It's really if you're doing lots of routing of stuff across the internet, you have to know that you know Apple computer have a class A network with 16 million addresses hidden behind it. Um, you know, yet um, uh, you know it's it's unusual nowadays that a company would even get a class C network. They probably only get a few IP addresses, a, a, a fragment of a class C network. Um, and uh, that's the point I've made there in the early years, the, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority just handed out A and B class networks too readily. And that, that's what's led to our problem. That's, but, you know, the thing that saved us is network address translation and NAT, NAT routers. Uh, they became popular in the mid-90s. And it basically means that one internet-facing IP address can have many local area network addresses hiding behind it. And to people out on the internet, it looks like it's just one computer. But, of course, you can have many yeah. computers, um, uh, you know, going across the, um, the, 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 the NAT router. It does break the original model of the internet, but it's good in as much as you know, it obscures the internal network from you know, all the bad guys on the internet. You can't see what's going on behind the NAT router. Uh, you know, if, you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to get access to a machine on the inside of the NAT router, if, if that machine hadn't, re had, hadn't already started a, a, a connection with you, you know, any packets you fire at the router trying to get to that, packet, that, that machine inside the, the, the network, uh, and that router just turns them away. Sorry, it's clearly not meant for any, anybody no. on my network. I'm keeping a track of all the sequence numbers of packets of, you know, of, of the guys on my, in my on my network. What they want, you know. Sorry, if 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 I don't recognize your name is not on the list. Yeah, yeah. If your sequence number isn't on the list, you're not coming in. Um, <laughs> and and so a NAT address router is a very effective firewall. You know, it's very yeah. you know, and it's you know nowadays it's what it's what Auntie Doris needs. It's what my mum needs. That you know, she needs a you know something segregating her network from the rest of the internet. Um, yeah. I can remember uh, hearing that apparently if you if you put an unpatched Windows XP machine on the web um, with a directly attached IP address, uh, it will become infected within ten seconds with numerous worms and other things that that, that know about some of the vul vulnerabilities within Windows. You know, the blaster worm, the, 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 the NIMDA virus, all those things. And it's just the fact that there are thousands of computers sitting in closets that, that are still on, on, the, on the web, never been patched. They're just sitting in a closet running a, you know, the control interface for a telephony system or they're running, you know, security cameras in some little company that's never patched or upgraded that machine in the 10 years it's been there. And, you know, many of them have got these these bits of malware, and so there's this just this general background internet radiation of 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 blaster, code red, NIMDA, and all those other bad things, which if you attach an unpatched Windows machine direct to the internet within ten seconds, it will be compromised. Uh, and you just think that's oh, amazing. Cool. Just 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 you know, it's because I'd I'd heard that you know hours. And even that was surprising. But ten seconds. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's current terrifying. reckoning. Yeah. Now, and that's worth knowing because actually, on on uh, domestic uh, routers, you've got you have the ability to expose a, a, yeah. a, a computer. To, you can say to put the this internet. in the DMZ, the, the demilitarized zone, yeah. without any of the benefits of the firewall. And uh, and if I, I've I've had my ISP sort of like say, can you connect the machine directly to the cable modem? And I've said no. That's just madness. Who connects anything directly to the internet that isn't isn't a well locked down server? You know. Um, yeah. So anyway, we we've and got define well locked down these days. It's yeah, going to have to be a team of scientists standing by. Right. So so there's our um, there's a, there's our, 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 our nice little diagram of our of our of our network address translation router and and, and how that works with the internet. Of course, the internet shows as a cloud as as it always is. Um. Which then makes us think. Um, yeah. We hear about hubs and routers and switches, but we don't hear about hubs so much anymore. They've kind of gone out of fashion. Uh, but routers and switches, and, and, and how, do, how do they differ? Um, well, a, a router yeah. is a networking device. Um, so it's, it's tailored to the task of routing and forwarding information. Uh, and routers connect uh, different logical subnets. So they might connect a local area network to, uh, uh, to, to a net, an internet-exposed IP address for an ISP. Or they might connect two office networks, which have dissimilar net, uh, IP schemas, and you want to be able to route traffic between them. But you don't want all the packets on one network to, to make it onto the other. So, so routers typically have dissimilar networks on either side of them, and their job is to decide 
how does stuff move between the networks? Um, so a network which is optimized for, for, for Ethernet LAN interfaces, uh, you know, may have other physical types. You know, might, might have fiber optic connections to, 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 to maybe, um, uh, you know, an ATM connection, you know, synchronous transfer mode, the 155 megabit connection, which is very, or was very popular, uh, you know, still used quite a lot. Um, uh, and, and, and so, generally speaking, um, the, 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 a router has to be programmed with the details of what's on either side of it. Um, a switch, yeah. the kind of thing you bolt into a, you know, the cabinet in your, in your machine room and connect all your avids to, that will learn what's on its ports. It will keep a little eye on all its network ports and it'll make a record of the MAC addresses of all the equipment. And so it will know that when you know, um, Avid3 requests a graphics file from graphics workstation number two, that it will just pass the data between those two ports. And that data doesn't have to go anywhere else on the network. It's switched between those two ports, and that's that. So a hub, which is the predecessor device, you know, uh, you know to a switch. In fact, the switches were originally called switching hubs. All that does is that just electrically isolates segments of a network. And any packet arriving on any port of the network will just get replicated across all the ports of the hub. And, and so oh, the hub, you know... Sort of a more of a DA than anything else. Ab absolutely, yeah, yeah. A distribution amplifier for, for network packets. Uh, and so that works, but that means that if you have a lot of heavy traffic between equipment on port one and port two, uh, the rest of the network has to suffer all that traffic as well. Because all those packets get replicated across all the ports and everything has to kind of watch that tedious network transfer of that big file between workstation A and workstation B, you know, which are over there. They're, they're not, you know. So, that's so that's what, that, hubs yeah. have kind of fallen out of fashion. You can't really get them anymore. Uh, switches are what you even, you know, the, the 50 quid box you have under the stairs at home is a, is a network switch. Um, uh, and, and and so that they're really that the, they're really the three kinds of um, uh, equipment that we bump into an awful lot. Now a switch can be as simple as an unmanaged switch that just does its thing by looking at the the the, the MAC addresses of, of packets, or it can be a very complicated Cisco forty nine hundred series, you, you know layer three switch where you can you can program virtual LANs in across different ports and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but fundamentally, they do very similar things, and, and you know, if you want to make good money, learn um, learn Cisco iOS, which is the language that used to program Cisco switches, because uh, you know lots of lots of companies um, are are Cisco exclusive houses, and if you can if you can set up their Cisco routers, there's kind of good money to be made. I think a thousand pounds a day is not atypical for a good Cisco engineer. Wow. So, uh, so that's, that's you know, if if you want to put the old broadcasting nonsense behind you and uh, and move into some proper money. Cisco is where it's at. Uh, you've got well, to, there you, you heard it here first, boys and girls. <laughs> you've got a question. You know, will Cisco always be around as, as prominently as they are? But, but before Cisco became popular, there was a big uh, company called uh, Gandalf Networks. Um, um, in fact, in the 80s and the early 90s, every machine room I ever walked into had Gandalf equipment. Uh, but you never hear of them now. I think they were bought by Lucent in the mid-90s and they disappeared. So, you know, big players can go the way of things, but I mean, Cisco are the big players at the moment. Um, so, so I suppose that that's kind of uh, the end of my my one hundred and one talk, and there were just sort of three little tips, tips and tricks I wanted to get onto before we finished up, Hugh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's great. I, I, I as I was saying to to Phil before we started talking before the last one, I was saying because I came from the world of, uh, of traditional TV and proper you know digits, um, the internet and IP was something I didn't actually get hands on. So this has been a really interesting introduction to it. Lots to follow up on and lots of learning to do, um, much clearer. So yeah, go on, give us a few tips and tricks to, to grease the wheels. Okay, so this is, this is one I use an awful lot at work. And, and so um, uh, we talked about um, uh, little local area networks uh, where typically an IP address might be 192.168.0. something, depending on the number yeah. of the equipment. And typically most, um, uh, Local area networks are run as uh, as as little you know two five five two five five two five five dot zero subnet masks. So there's a maximum of two hundred fifty four devices. Yeah. What happens if you've got a piece of equipment? Uh, so not a computer, because generally speaking, you can get to the network interfaces on a computer very easily and, and see what their IP address are. What happens if you've got a piece of equipment that you can figure over its web interface, but you don't know what its IP address is, and you want to you want to be able to web into it, but without a knowledge of what subnet it's on. Uh, so you can't set your laptop to being on the same subnet, i.e. say the piece of equipment was 
192.168.1.220 and you want to yeah. connect to that and configure it, you've got to set your, your, la your laptop's uh, IP address to 192.168.1.something but not dot yeah. 220 because 220 is used already. Yeah. But, but if you didn't know what the uh, IP address of the equipment was, you're kind of up the creek. You know, how do, I, how do I set an address on my laptop to get into this piece of equipment if I don't know what its network address is? So there's a fantastic yeah. trick called the, the multicast subnet, which is uh, uh, 224.0.0.0.4, which in network talk means that there's a possibility of, 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 um, of two changes in IP address. Uh, but if you use the network address okay. 224, Dot zero, dot zero, dot one. The rule is that everything that hears that ping uh, has to respond, and it has to respond with its IP address. So ping is a little utility that, that all operating systems have, and you might have to fire up a a, a, a terminal program. And I'm, I'm just firing up a yeah. terminal on my machine here. So here, Phil's MacBook Pro, and 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 ping is 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 this useful little uh, utility. It's called Packet Internet Gopher, which which sends out a test packet to say you know, uh, who's out there, and if you recognize this IP address, please reply. So it's like a little sort of test. So if I go 224.0.0.1 on this machine, uh, we can see lots of different pieces of equipment on the workshop network, you know, this, our server, our, our, our um, security camera, um, you know, other things start replying, and they start offering back their IP addresses. So that's incredibly Very useful. Handy. And that also works with, um, with things on different IP addresses. So, so what I've done here is, and this is a little screen grab, I've, I've hard set the network address of my laptop's network adapter to 192.168.1.220. Yeah. And I don't know what IP address the equipment I've got connected to my network is. So then I offer a ping, and if I did this at home when I did this screen capture, and you can see there's all the things responding on my home network. So I happen to know that dot four is our Xbox, uh, dot eight is, is um, the kitchen computer. Dot 13 is my little NAS. Dot 230, I think, is one of the kids' iPads. Um, so even though I'm on a totally different subnet, a totally different IP range, uh, by issuing the uh, ping 224.0.0.1, everything on the network responds and says, oh, look, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. And if, if all you had on your network was the piece of equipment you want to start um, uh, remoting into and configuring, that's remarkably handy because you now know the yeah. IP address that people, and you can then set your network address appropriately and take remote control of the equipment. So for us, where we where we have equipment come back from uh, customers on demo and they've set it up for their networks and they often don't bother to tell us what they've set it to, this is remarkably good because we can just get it back to a known good working state very quickly. So that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's an Ethernet tip I use all the time, an IP tip I use all the time. The other one is occasionally I have to slow down Ethernet. So everything nowadays is gigabit Ethernet, isn't it? You know. Yeah. yeah. But there are occasions when I want things to work at 100 base T or even 10 base T um, because maybe I've got a bit of legacy kit that doesn't know about that, and maybe the network switch isn't auto negotiating down to those slower speeds. In fact, I've got a um, I've got a little Linux-based media player machine at home, which only works nicely at 10 base T. But I can't persuade anything else on my network to I can't persuade the switch to ramp down to that. So I have to do things to force it. Okay. Now, if the thing you want to force down is a Windows computer or a Mac computer, within the network settings, you can always get in there and say, no, 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 10 base T, please. That's how fast you're going. Uh, and, and that can help you out because obviously 10 base T goes about 300 meters down Cat6 cable, whereas 100 base and gigabit go much shorter distances. Oh, yes. um, uh, and, and there may be the question of reliability with legacy equipment, and, and, and it may just be that gigabit's too fast for your application. So, so the, way, the way to do it, is um, if you don't want something to behave at gigabit speed, is make up your Ethernet cable, but only make it up with the orange and the green pairs, because gigabit relies on four pairs, whereas 100 base T only relies wow. on, on the, the orange and the green pairs. So make up a custom Ethernet cable, which will force things down to 100 base T. Um, the other thing you can do is, if you've, if you've held on to an old-fashioned ba 10 base T hub, you can just stick that in the way, and that will force the network down to, to, to the slower speed. Find um, the lowest common speed. I yeah. Guess. Or you know, finally, and this is a real bodge, uh, but it works often. Is rather than making up the network cable to the to, to the right specification, so the orange pair, then the green pair split across the blue pair, and then the brown pair in your RJ45 connector. Uh, make it up in some random fashion, but, but keep it the same at each end of the cable, and then you lose all the common mode rejection that the twisted pairs offer. 
And that often forces the switch to ramp down to the slowest transmission speed of, of 10 base T. Because it's going, are you there, Moriarty? Sorry! Are yeah, yeah, yeah there? there's just noise what? on the line, and, 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 and the common mode rejection isn't working anymore because we've scrambled up the twisted pairs. Um, yeah. So I've done that a few times to force things down to slower speeds. Um, that's so that's, really that's, that's another little network tip that I've, I've often had to make use of. And the final thing is we talked about this, and I think this really reveals a lot about how networks work, is port forwarding on Skype. So Skype is a fantastic um, voice and video over IP system. It's what we're using at the moment. It's what lots of people use. And, uh, and it, it relies... Uh, and, and so think about this. So I'm, I'm sitting in the Route 6 workshop, and I'm behind a network address translation router. The, the, the IP address of this, of this computer is 192.168.1.1. 220 I think you've got a similar arrangement in your in your in your workshop there in your in your garden shed there Hugh what do you what do you call your shed is it you call it your workshop it's, or your it's the garden office the garden, fact, office. garden office garden office the, the, there's a whole load of uh, you know there's, there's a community of garden workers out there garden <laughs> office workers rather so yeah so if you, you put that into the internet you'll suddenly find you, you've got them. a similar <laughs> configuration you've got a network address translation yeah. router that's connected either to a cable modem or to a, a an adsl connection and and so your computer there has got a similar unroutable network address so we've both got unroutable network addresses how on earth do our two computers exchange information with each other can't be done we're doing can't, it can't be done but, uh, well it can be done once you've got the connection going because both network address translation routers are now watching the sequence numbers and they keep the connection up but to make the call for my computer to call your computer and your computer to start going deep do deep do phil's calling you know we have to have a way through and so what skype yeah. does is skype has this con concept of a super node which if you're a skype user with a particularly fast network connection and a particularly pokey computer unbeknownst to you the skype mothership will say oh that's good you could be a super node for a little while and so you're maintaining the connections of the Skype community. And uh, and so when I call Hugh, actually, I call my local supernode. My local supernode deals with it. Yeah, So the local supernode has to be exposed and on the internet, i.e. not behind the NAT router. And it has to be have enough you know, bandwidth to handle this. And so when I make the call, I'm going via a supernode because the supernode can see both of us. And we can both see the supernode, but we can't see each other because we're both behind NAT routers. So the problem there is that now there's a there's a third party involved, and so you know with the with kind of the packets are going twice as far, and and they're having to be reflected off another computer that might not be up to the job, and blah blah blah. So the really nice thing you can do with Skype is that you can tell Skype, um, you can tell your route. Well, first of all, you have to tell you have to know what port Skype is using. So when you install Skype, so this is a screen grab from a Windows computer, but if I if I go to uh, the Skype, if I go to the Skype we're using now, I'll probably drop the call, so I won't. Um, but but Skype randomly assigns a high order port when you install it. Uh, but you can you can click yeah. in there and you can change that port to something that you like, and then you can go to your router and you can set up a routing rule that says whenever packets come in addressed to port three two five three on this screen grab, just send them through to that computer, please. Uh, and so what that does is that means essentially. Although our, the computer is still, by and large, behind the net router, it's not it's not exposed to the internet per se. That one little port where Skype's running is constantly listening out on the internet because the router is letting packets through on that on that on that network port. And so that means that when I call when you call me, uh, we're able to make a direct connection immediately yeah. without having to go via a super node. And that means that from the get-go, our conversation is point to point rather than via a super node. And that can that can double the quality of a Skype call, you know. Uh, yeah. Y y you know, um, I, I always feel... It's, uh, but the thing is, you only have to do it at one end. You know, if you've got it only at one end, then that's enough to to be able to get to the other net router and for it to then start recording sequence numbers so that there's a hole through it to the computer on the other side. If, if you're... If, if you haven't done it on either end, then you have to go by the super node. If you've done it on one end, you can go. You can do a direct connection, and 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 so that again, that's the that's the second thing I do whenever I set up Skype. You know, I, I go and open up a port on the router, and I make sure I've got a well assigned uh, port number on Skype, and and uh, you know, I enjoy uh, crystal clear Skype calls as a result, and make Skype you know infinitely more usable. How interesting! Yeah. Well, that that's going to make a big difference. I shall be doing that straight away. Um, and that will make a difference when I'm Skyping other people because you've already taken the magic for yourself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, that's so I just wanted to mention where we're, where we're starting to. Richard's email is kind of like genius into action, and we're, we're probably going to start 
and uh, some show notes and uh, you know to make this perhaps a bit more useful and I've, I've started building a wiki around this which at some point will kind of make live on the web now uh, I've just got that up on the screen at the moment you can get you can get all our stuff from from iTunes uh, as, as video podcasts in both standard yep. and high, high res formats um, blip TV is where uh, we host these things from um, uh, and, and, and sorry again got that up on the screen with the appropriate lower thirds and um, and you know, both Hugh and I kind of uh, have got websites you can go and look at and, uh, and find yep. out about what we do. So there's Hugh, Water Technical Services. It's a splendid yep. photo of you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me look a bit bald, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just scrolling down through uh, through my blog, which has got lots of nonsense on it. And and Phil's technical blog is actually superb. Actually, it's, it's it really is excellent. So. I think it's a classic case of don't believe what you read on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yes, we have some um, some interesting thoughts and ideas coming up for next year. So um, this will probably be our last one before Christmas, I would think. I would have thought uh, so. And, um, unless you get really inspired. But uh, uh, other than that, we will be back in the new year uh, with some, some more, probably raspberry pie flavoured, um, because I'm hoping over the Christmas holidays, Phil's going to have time to, to have a play. Look at that, a man with a pie. Uh, so that's what we got, but some other ideas floating about. But as ever, if you are watching it and you think, oh, I'd like to hear about this or I'd like to think about that, please drop us a line, just like Richard Lancaster did. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. And again, if you suddenly think of something um, else, you're not debarred from asking for more. Um, so there we are. Thank you very much, Phil, for yet another really interesting uh, talk there. That's absolutely fascinating from my perspective. Jolly good one. And uh, there we are. Two old geezers chewing the fat, um, and uh, hopefully some good stuff comes out, and uh, and I will see yeah. you very soon, Hugh. You will indeed. Cheerio. Thanks a lot.